lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing okay. Yeah, good. Happy, happy Veterans Day. Our, our Mistest Day, our or Mistest Day. Remembrance Day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in, in the victory, no, it wasn't really VE Day, but yeah. Um, no. Yeah. I, I was very disappointed that banks were closed and the post office didn't pick up. <laughs> so you, was this a surprise to you or a did bit. you see it coming? Uh, I mean, I saw on my calendar that it said Veterans Day, but I was like, it's in the middle of the week. People aren't going to take the day off. Uh, no, you're wrong about that. I knew yeah. the banks would be closed because they, they warned me earlier in the week. <laughs> Doctor's offices. I hey, my doc, my, the, the one my wife works at was open today. Yeah, I, I wanted to... I, had I was supposed to have gotten my um my monthly allergy shots on Monday. Yeah. And I forgot. Oh yeah. <laughs> so I, I was forgot. gonna go yeah, I was gonna go today. Um and uh I called and it just rang and rang and rang. They didn't even have an answering service to pick up. Was, uh, oh man. Yeah. So so yeah. I feel all right. <laughs> so you're not all sick from it getting a bunch of shots. <laughs> yeah, then, I'm right? not I'm not like yeah. wearing down already or anything. Nice. Um I don't know. It would have been nice to have gotten it today instead of tomorrow because now I'm going to have to get the shots on Friday and come home from work on Friday and crash. Yeah. Oh, well. Be sick all weekend. Yeah. I mean, it's not, it doesn't affect me that badly, but it does make me feel kind of just like worn down and a little crappy for about 24 hours or so. Well, I'll tell you, this is a holiday that a lot of people take very seriously. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm not even so much against that. Like, I mean, I know we talk a lot on this show that we're, um, you know, anti-war and bring, but to me, I think the anti-war system is the most pro-veteran system. Yeah. If you are position, if you ask me, because I mean, we don't want to create more dead people. Yeah. <laughs> like particularly our own countrymen. Or like, disabled veterans. Or disabled, yeah. the same thing. I mean, and I have tons of respect for anybody who served. Um, I, I do. I, I would. I would interrupt there, and it's not that I uh, that there's a, a inherent disrespect or anything like that, but um, just like police or any other position, I don't feel that you deserve respect just because you have the uniform. Well, I agree with that. I mean, there's bad people everywhere mm-hmm. in in every group, yeah. but but I'm okay with like I'm okay with Veterans Day, and I'm okay with Veterans Day kind of being a big holiday. Yeah, well, like, just I mean, like law enforcement for me, I think by and large people sign up for. Uh, a reason of, you know, some kind of idea of duty or patriotism or whatever. And I respect that. Yeah. And me too. I tried to join the military. Yeah. I considered it very briefly. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I failed on a deal with my parents is how that it really started. But, uh, uh yeah. you know, by the time I was through with the whole process, I was disappointed that I didn't get in. Yeah. yeah. Um, cause I, I had some medical issues that they um, couldn't, couldn't. didn't, uh, didn't want to possibly well, have to pay you, for in the you future. You were a few years early. I think a couple yeah, of more years well, you would have. No, they would have snatched was, you right on yeah, up. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> I scored I, in the 99th percentile in the ASVAB. They told me like I could have any job that I wanted. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, I had definitely picked something. Um, but uh, and I ended up doing something kind of like it, but it wouldn't have been as exciting. I didn't get to carry a gun. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, it. By the time I didn't get in, it was like a really, really a disappointment. Yeah. Um, now, part of that, too, was that I didn't have another plan <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like I had just assumed. But this was 1998. Yeah. Um, so, so pre 9-11. Yeah. So when I was getting it. <laughs> not long. But I was trying to join the Air Force, which is a four year term. Oh, yeah. So uh, I would have still been in. Yeah. Um, in 2002. And of course we know now the majority of Americans don't know or yeah. didn't anyway. Yeah. Um, but we know that, uh, the air force was quite active in the late nineties. Uh, oh, yeah. in the middle East. So, <laughs> you know. yeah, that's true. Not as active as they were after <laughs> well, <that's laughs> 2002, true. but, but you're right. There was a lot, they were, they were busy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, and at the time I thought that, um, that I wanted to be, uh, 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 PJ, oh, yeah. um, which is a uh, pararescue oh, okay. in the Air Force. And yeah. so instead, I my I developed a plan B, which was to become um, an EMT. And I did that instead for a few years. Yeah, yeah. 
That's cool. But it's not the same as being an EMT that jumps out of airplanes. I was going to say, it's not the same as getting to jump out of a plane and then do it. And then shoot people. (laughs) Potentially. Yeah. 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 Keep blood in some, get as much out of the others as you can, you know. know. Yeah. Um, But But, no, I I think that it's important to remember uh, the veterans. And um, I I don't like using the word sacrifice very much. Yeah. um, Because people make choices. You you just, you make choices. Yeah. Um, You know what's at risk, I think. Well, I don't know that you do at 18, honestly. Yeah, it was different at 18. I mean, it's not that you don't know what's at risk, but it's, you feel like you're invincible. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you have that. Yeah, you still so. think forever is ahead of you. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You get to be my age, and like, there you realize there's no forever. <laughs> right. You're starting to you're starting to see an end. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it's definitely not the same thing. But, um, but the other part of that, and and maybe the part that I would like people to think about more is the all the damage that's been done to the veterans, and who's really done that to them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, your first instinct might be that it would be the enemies of the United States. Um, but my response is that it, it no, it's the government of the United States. Oh. The government of the United States is who has put those people in that position. Yeah. Um, and in a lot of cases created those enemies <laughs> as well. well. It, exactly. I mean, they're the, the U S government's the enemy on both sides. They yeah. created the bad guys and they're sending so, our people over there to be, go be hurt and maimed and yeah. all of these things. And you they're, know? they're sacrificing our people and sacrifice is an appropriate word in that, and, in, that in that context. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, yeah. And it just goes to show, I mean, even um, like the Ron Paul campaigns were very heavily military, like supported by the military. Mm-hmm. And it, it's because the pe- at least a, most pe- a lot of people in the military understand that a, so much of this is unnecessary. Yeah. And when I say people in the military, I mean the actual like, I don't mean combat like... Combat soldiers. The combat, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The people who, who deal with this firsthand, not, yeah. you know, so... Not the uh, power structure. Exactly. Yeah. Um, speaking of the power structure, though. Yeah. The uh, Pentagon review. Okay, so you remember that our last great act coming out of Afghanistan was to drop a uh, drone bomb on a family um, with a bunch of kids. Oh wait, no, no, no. That was ISIS K, right? No, they were, they were, they were. That was they were taking care of terrorists when they did that. No, no, no. That that's when. Oh, you. Oh, right, right. No, we didn't even. We we the United States, the Pentagon, barely even hung on to that story for. That was the uh, like initial had, story. Yeah. Like yeah. that was the original story. Yeah. Um, and then it turned out that he was working for an NGO uh, about feeding people. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know the. Oh gosh, who was it? Millie that got out there and said that there weren't any mistakes made or something like that at the yeah. time. That it was yeah. a righteous killing. It was a righteous killing. Yep. Yeah. Um, so then, of course, some uh, independent press got in there and started talking to people and found out what had really happened. Yeah. And uh, found out that we had killed ten perfectly harmless people, seven of whom were children. <laughs> and uh, and then uh, I think Biden promised that people would be held accountable for this. Yeah. <clears throat> well, we have the results now of the, the Pentagon's investigation of itself. This oh, that's a, always the best way to do an investigation. I like, those are yes. the best type of, that's the way I like to investigate myself. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I think that the, the head of this investigation was in fact an air force guy even. Oh, wow. Um, so, uh, the Pentagon review concluded that there was no misconduct and no negligence, and they do not recommend any disciplinary action. Hmm. Yeah, that's about the size of it. Of course, the family's over there saying, well, we were told that we were going to get some sort of reparations and that justice would be yeah. held, and they haven't even heard anything from the U.S. government yeah. in months. Not a thing. Um, and uh, I, I think probably the the part that I want to draw the most attention to um, is what's fairly typical here which is the government investigating itself and finding that it had it done nothing wrong. Well, and here's here's my takeaway from that. So okay, you tell me that and I'm like, well, if they didn't if they did nothing wrong, then this whole system is broken. Yeah. Well, right. If okay, so if there was no misconduct yeah. and there was no negligence, 
Yeah. Are we saying that this is what standard operating procedure? Yeah. This is this is standard exactly. That's exactly my point. Yeah. Is um, they did actually say that it was an accident, but I think you know the as far as they're concerned, the accident really is that the public knows about this. Yeah, exactly. And you know, like Manning, uh, Chelsea Manning served a couple of prison terms, and um, Julian Assange were still trying to extradite yeah. uh, for revealing this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, Actually, in Afghanistan and Iraq. <laughs> right. Of, yeah. The same place that this occurred. Yeah. One of the same places this occurred. Um, and the, you know, the other part that I, as far as drawing attention to the government investigating itself and finding that it, uh, finding itself clear of all charges, essentially, <laughs> right. um, is that this is a lot of what goes on when you have, um, with law enforcement. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, <laughs> you know... Every once in a while, they find um, they find in favor of the people that were abused by the police. Yeah. It's not that it doesn't happen, yeah. but in the vast majority of cases, that's not what they find. Yeah. And you have to think about it in terms of um, whether you would want a dispute between yourself and somebody else to be mediated by somebody that's paid by the same people as the person that you're... Yeah. disputing with yeah exactly like if you had a dispute with walmart with a walmart employee yeah. would you be comfortable with walmart management mediating that dispute yeah obviously not the difference there is is you just don't go to walmart anymore well yeah. and and that's the problem but that is the problem here is there's no opt out of the system yeah like i mean you have to deal with law enforcement yeah like you, there is no opt out um that was a, a you know like one of the big questions of consent like, yeah. if you have no way of withdrawing consent, how can you have given consent? If there's no yeah. opt-out, how did you opt in? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, that got us a little off track. I, I don't yeah. really want to go it's, down that's that That's not where we hole. were going I mean, with I, this. I but. was immediately thinking, though, of the Lysander Spooner quote about uh, government of consent, which is one of my favorite quotes. And I don't have my little book in here, so I'm not going to have it exactly right. But um, he said something along the lines of the only thing that they have ever determined of a uh, of a, what a government of consent is, is that it is one to which you must consent or be shot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, I mean, that's all I really have. I just want to point out that we... Like, we did this. Like, and, yeah. and I mean, it's... <laughs> it and, it, and it's... I think it... Ha I mean, I know, there is no I think. This happens a lot. Yeah. Um, and the only the the big thing that I, I kind of want to emphasize is is that the only reason we know that is because of independent journalists. Mm -hmm. um, your your big media would never have told you this story without like independent people on the ground going in and figuring this out. Yeah. Um, Unless and, Trump had done it. Well, yeah. Well, if Trump had done it, it'd be yeah, the media would have been all over it. Actually, I'm not even so sure about that. They may. Like, they probably. <laughs> honestly, you're right. They probably wouldn't have been because yeah. it's it's. It was still, mostly a joke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, it's just, and I've, not recently, but I've heard people downplay kind of the, the importance of independent media mm -hmm. and not just trusting whatever is on the TV, what is on the mainstream media. Yeah. And I'm telling you, independent media is, is, is the, the last of a dying breed. Like there's just not enough of yeah. it out there. Um, yeah. One of the people that I think is the, is one of the quintessential or great American writers is Hunter S. Thompson. Yeah. Yeah. I love Hunter S. Thompson. Yeah. Um, and I would recommend to anybody who has a lot of time on your hands, <laughs> yeah. um, to, uh, to go out and buy, uh, the great shark hunt, yeah. which is a collection of his journalistic pieces from like the sixties through 1978, I think somewhere in there, yeah. which was the height of his career. Um, yeah. and has some fantastic, fantastic stuff, like really insightful, um, funny and, uh, and hard hitting journalism. Yeah. And he was an independent journalist. He was out there chasing the best story where he could get the best money where it was at. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, to yeah. sell his story to somebody yeah. and it just doesn't really much work that way anymore. Yeah. Um, most journalists work for a particular outlet. They're given assignments instead of out there trying to find a scoop. Yeah. Um, and, and, if they, and a whole lot of it is actually just like handed out from the government to the people that report on it. Yeah. Well, and that's just it. It's, you're really just kind of a middleman at this point. Mm -hmm. And if you do have somebody that goes out and finds that story, like I forget the lady's name, but somebody had the Epstein story like 
yeah. back in 2013 or something. And the, mm. the they just turned their nose up at it. And they didn't yeah. want to deal with it. That's because she worked for a mainstream media company. Well, and that's my point, is yeah. that the mainstream media didn't want what could have been at the time a massive story. Mm-hmm. Um, just because they didn't want to deal with the headache of it. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it just goes to kind of show you. Yeah, and we're aware now of uh, what was it, Operation Mockingbird, where the intelligence services were trying to place people within the media, yeah, um, so that they could control the story. Yeah, um, and I, I think that we're seeing the results of that. I frankly. think so. Yeah, uh, and even if you like, you don't even need some kind of undercover like fake journalist in there anymore. Like no. now, people that um, that are reporters or that are consultants or whatever they call them on CNN and MSNBC and Fox and everywhere else yeah. are people that had been with the CIA or DIA Openly or with NSA. the CIA. Yeah. 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 I mean, they introduce them that way. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, former CIA director, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And I mean, we got to take, and we, we got to take his word John for Brennan. it. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> that guy's been wrong about everything for years. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, Clapper is a consulting, um, you know, reporter or whatever. And oh, yeah. this guy is a guy that sat in front of Congress and lied repeatedly. Yeah. <laughs> and we know it. And he was never held accountable for that, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Um, because those are okay lies. Exactly. Mm. So just, you know, it's be aware that the system that you put your faith in, um, well, some of you anyway. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, you got to figure at least the majority of people that are listening to this show are pretty in tune with alternative media. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, I, you know, I kind of hope that that's not true. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't want this podcast to be here so that we could preach to the choir. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm not saying, I'm just saying there a lot of people are going to be into alternative media. Yeah. yeah. Well, but the, the thing that I, I want people to be aware of is that um, whenever you have a problem with the state, the only place you have to turn for a solution is the state. Yeah. And the state has a vested interest in defending the state. That has been uh, like a common theme of this podcast from the very beginning. Oh, absolutely. Is that, that you have to understand that the only place that you you have to turn is the state, and the state is going to side with the state the great majority of the time. Exactly. And that's not justice. No, in no way. No. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to get people to turn over the legal system. I, <laughs> it's not happening so far, but it, no. yeah. um, there are alternatives. Absolutely. Uh, and, and I hope we've expressed some of those on the podcast before, like when, in the defund the police period when we were saying, well, you know, it's not the, the way they were approaching it is wrong. Cause they're just saying, well, we're just going to re- replace police with guidance counselors or whatever. Um, or we're just yeah. going to, um, get rid of it entirely. And then you're on your own. Well, that's not what people want to hear. Like no. people don't want to be without security. They would rather have state security than no security. Yeah. Um, and, uh, we were trying to tell people that there are private versions of this that are always already going on. Yeah. Uh, and the same thing with the court systems. Yeah. We're getting way off track here, but this is worth saying, well, um, you know, there's private security all over the place. And if you're, if you weren't paying into, um, the government security, you could probably more easily afford private security, even if you're poor and yeah. you still have homeowners associations or community organizations or whatever that can pull resources to do these kind of things. Yeah. And then of course there's the court system. And that's where people really get hung up a lot of time. Well, how in the world would you have a court system without the government? Yeah. Well, we do it all the time. Private yeah. arbitration is all over the place. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that is an independent private court system. Yeah. And it, it's you don't have to worry about it's it's completely just like you say it's completely independent mm-hmm. it's no no government oversight yeah <laughs> or overreach yeah um yeah i was trying to spin this to start talking about the written house trial that's going on uh well um this is one of the things that you need to be able to do uh <laughs> without uh without a police i guess yeah um no I, it's even with police, the the ability to defend yourself is very important. Yeah. And, and, and this is another one of those things that the government's doing all the time, is trying to take away your ability to take care of yourself yeah. so that you're more and more reliant on it. Um, and one of those things is to take away your ability to defend yourself so that you're reliant on um, the enforcement of the government to defend you. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is a case that's hopefully going to push in the other direction because it's I it, I, so I watched a bunch. I've I've been following it, and I watched a bunch yesterday. I just don't see any way they convict him. 
Mm-hmm. Like I just, I, I, I can't believe they took this to trial. Yeah. Like, I mean, cause after all of this happened and the story kind of came out, like I was just under the assumption that they weren't pursuing this. Yeah. And when it popped up a few weeks ago that this was trial was fixed to start, I was like, they didn't drop those charges. Mm-hmm. Like I just was kind of dumbfounded that this was even going forward. Yeah. And well, and you have a sympathetic judge. I know that much. I haven't been following the trial, but I'm, the, I'm aware of well, some of the decisions before the trial got started that would suggest that the judge is sympathetic to people the ability to defend yourself. I've heard, I've heard a lot of people say that the judge is sympathetic because the judge mm-hmm. has been really hard on the prosecution. The clips I saw and the, the parts that I watched yesterday, mm-hmm. the um, judge was really hard on the prosecution, but he needed to be. The prosecution was stepping out of line. Mm-hmm. And to me, it wasn't In what even, way? What was happening? Well, he was, um, there was one point, I want to say when um, he was cross-examining um, Rittenhouse, um, where he was trying to get him to, he was using the fact that he was um, your your right to um, ah the first one to remain silent. Oh yeah. Um, he was trying to use the right to remain silent to incriminate him on the stand, and like the the judge got mad. He he, he mm-hmm. moved he put, pushed the jurors out and and like chewed him out. And mm-hmm. that was like in the first like ten minutes of him examining him or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it just kind of devolved from there. There were a few other instances, and I didn't get to watch all of it because it was extremely long. Yeah. But, uh, and I actually think I missed some of the best parts towards the end when he really got hard on, when the judge really got hard on him. But it was the same type thing where he was trying to do all of these because there was some evidence that had been, um, from, and that had been, um, not w- was not going to be presented from the beginning. They had uh, um, predetermined. Yeah. And so then the prosecutor was trying to ask him questions about some of those things. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so, uh, and, and that's where the judge should step in. I mean, those are yeah. areas where in a lot of cases, the judge doesn't step in and stop a prosecutor from doing things that he's not supposed to do. Yeah. Well, um, when I say sympathetic, I don't mean necessarily that like in an inappropriate way no yeah um i I just uh remember one of the things is that the uh, prosecution was forbidden from referring to any of the people that kyle rittenhouse shot as victims yeah um because it it's uh well it's language that pre yeah yeah. um, it it sets it up to seem like he was that rittenhouse was doing making an aggressive act yeah yeah um, and, and the whole and the whole idea is is that this case is about whether he did or not. Yeah, it, it is. You know? It's biasing language. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I, I think it was an appropriate thing for the judge to do to say that you can't do that. Absolutely. You can't refer to these people as victims. Yeah. Um, well, but, uh, there's a fair chance I don't. And I I scoured the news today and I didn't hear any. I didn't hear find anything about the Rittenhouse trial today. So I don't know if they had. Maybe they had the day off today. Oh, Veterans, Veterans Day. Day, probably. Uh, probably, because that Government actually, work, I, you know? I just like <laughs> made that connection because I scoured the internet before I came here to find out if, because nothing ever popped up about about it today. Mm-hmm. But um, there's a fair chance that, and not, I don't think there's a good chance. I think they'll proceed with the trial and we'll see how the how it shakes out. But the um, defense did ask for a, um, what you might, oh, God, I can't think of the name of it now. We're um, a mistrial with prejudice. Okay. Where they, which means they wouldn't be able to try him again. Yeah. Um, which, I mean, I'm not going to say that I absolutely think that that's warranted, but I think it's fair to at least request it and it to be considered, given the things I saw yesterday. Um, I think that I would probably rather see it conclude with a not guilty. Well, me too. And that's the reason I say that um, I don't think that there's a strong chance that that's actually yeah. going to... Because I, Let's I think, go ahead and set a real precedent about what... What self-defense is. Yeah. Yeah. Because this is, um, I mean... Uh, On the other given, hand, if they finish it, um, then it can be appealed. And yeah. going to a higher court might not be the best thing for self-defense. Well, it, yeah. <laughs> Do you think that they would, though? I. This this seems so cut and dry self defense. I just don't yeah, see how they could. I don't know. Well, because it's not about what the law really is. Yeah. Uh, it's this this trial isn't about establishing the law. It's about making a new law or yeah. about reinterpreting the law. Yeah. I mean, the prosecution didn't have the intent of um, of I think of proving that within the existing law that Kyle Rittenhouse was not acting in self-defense. I think that the goal is to change what that means. Yeah. Yeah. 
which is scary. Yeah. <laughs> like that's, that's not, that's not a good road to, to head set down. a precedent that this kind of situation is not self-defense, that you do not have the right to defend yourself Yeah. in this, this kind of situation. I don't know though. Yeah. Um, I, maybe they just bit off more than they could chew. I, I don't know. Uh, well, I mean, uh, maybe it. it just got so much press that they felt that they had to take it to trial. Uh, that's been my kind of interpretation of it is that they just, they felt like to me, at least from the outside looking in that they, they, uh, they had to have felt pressure to do mm-hmm. something here because, and there's a lot of people who, who think he's guilty. Yeah. Like I've, um, I mean, of course I'm in my echo chamber and my social media. So we're all like, understand that this was self-defense, but, um, kind of branching out into some of the, um, other comment sections on some of the mainstream media. Mm-hmm. A lot of people think this guy needs to be guilty. Yeah. Um, and they're honestly, <laughs> They don't seem very educated on the subject matter, <laughs> but <laughs> what a surprise! <laughs> a big shocker there, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so uh, we'll have to see how it shakes out, but I, yeah. I don't see how they convict him. Well, in in other um, changing of language and adding of rules and so forth, I was trying to. That wasn't a very smooth segue. Oh well. Um, yeah. So they they did OSHA did finally announce rules uh, actually last week I think right before we podcasted yeah. um, uh, announced rules uh, to put Biden's vaccine mandates in place for businesses with over a hundred employees yeah um, it was uh, immediately challenged in court um, yeah. and the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals put a stay. I think is the term. Yeah, um, that was my understanding on the rule, which wasn't even supposed to take effect till January, till early January, yeah. which I find strange by itself. I mean, I guess you have to give some time to, uh, to establish well, the infrastructure bi- and so forth. Businesses to do this, are but, already trying to put things um, together to figure out how the how they're going to handle this. Yeah, um, um, but and- at the same time, if this is like the the very scary thing that we're all supposed to believe that it is, then this uh, is peak time. And this is the answer to the, to all of our problems. This is the panacea is just uh, having everybody vaccinated. Then giving another two months seems a little strange, yeah. but, but that's because that's, and we all know this, but that's not what it's about. It's about control. Yeah. It's about giving the government another way to tell you how to, to run your business mm-hmm. in this and your life and your life. Yeah. 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 Um, well, and at the same time, roughly, uh, the CDC changed some definitions. Um, So the CDC changed the definitions of vaccine and vaccination, like the official statutory, I guess, definitions of these, these terms. Um, and, uh, the changes that they made are kind of interesting. Um, so the, the definite definition of vaccine, um, or sorry, the definite, well, actually probably better to start with vaccine, isn't it? Um, the definition of a vaccine was a product that stimulates a person's immune system to produce immunity to a specific disease. And it has been changed to a preparation that is used to stimulate the body's immune response against diseases. Now, strictly speaking, um, you could maybe make the argument that rubbing dirt in a wound then is a vaccine <laughs> because yeah. it is likely to stimulate your body's immune response against bacteria that are in the dirt. It's always worked for me. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. um, so this is, well, this is part of a trend. And so the, the vaccination change is the act of introducing a vaccine into the body to provide immunity to a disease. And they changed the word immunity to protection. So yeah. now it's to, uh, to, um, introduce a vaccine into the body to provide protection to a disease or against a disease. Yeah. Um, now the, the thing that's interesting about both of these changes is that they change them from, f- from words that have a very specific meaning to words that have a very nebulous meaning. Yeah. Yep. Um, so yeah. I don't know, make it that way Le- you will. <laughs> now the it's CDC, all, it's all open to interpretation. Yeah. The, the CDC made the argument that, well, vaccines have never uh, provided, um, absolute immunity. And so they're just clarifying. Oh, yeah. Um, so, cause they didn't want to be misleading. Yeah. Uh, it, you mean anymore? Like, <laughs> <laughs> right. So you've been misleading for the last, I think it's been 11 years since they last changed the definition. Oh, yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, you've been misleading for a decade and now you want to be a little bit more clear by being a little more vague. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but really it's, 
it's because there are there are challenges to whether these things are vaccines at all. There have been yeah. from the beginning. Well, not if you um, change the definition of what a vaccine is. <laughs> yeah, in the same way that maybe it's not self-defense if you change what self-defense is. Hey, there you go. Um, yep. And, uh, you know, it's it's not a war crime if you change the standard <laughs> operating procedure. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, right. So, I it's, don't know. It's amazing I'm, the upside-down world we live in right now. Yeah. Like... Um, so the whole thing's dubious to me. And, uh, you know, at the same time, I, I don't think this has gotten a lot of press, but I don't really watch a lot of mainstream media. So I honestly wouldn't know. Yeah. Um, but I think this, that it's, it's huge news that, um, this lady, Brooke Jackson, that used to work Ventavia, uh, for Ventavia, which was a, a subcontractor, um, that was hired by Pfizer to oversee their clinical trial stage three for the uh, mRNA vaccine for COVID. Yeah. Um, and probably many other things too, but the, in this specific case, it was about the COVID vaccines, uh, most of which were conducted in Texas. Um, she has become a... Um, what? What's the term when it's information that you release that you're not supposed to know that they actually don't want you to know? No, no, no. Oh. When they don't want you to know the information. It's only oh. a whistleblower if they actually want you to know the information. Uh, um, and they release it. Did you miss that podcast? That was one that you weren't here. Maybe, I know. Maybe you yeah. didn't listen. Um, or you're still sick when you did. So did <laughs> yeah, I was definitely still sick when I did. So. <laughs> um, but uh, no, this is the other thing. This is a traitor. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, Brooke Jackson had been a regional director, and um, she reported some irregularities in the data management and laboratory management and so forth to the FDA and was fired on the same day. Wow. Um, and so, like, but some of the accusations... Uh, and there have been, there's been anonymous commentary from other employees that agreed with that what she said. Saw the same, saw the same thing yeah. she did. Um, now, anonymous sources are take that always, for what it's worth. Yeah. yeah. Um, but clearly, uh, her situation is a good example of why you might want to remain anonymous. Exactly. Um, because she was immediately fired. Like, if you have a good job in this industry and yeah. it's a fairly tight knit industry. Um, if you are known to be somebody that might release information that, that your company doesn't want released, you may never get a job again in that industry. Yeah. Right. So there's, there's yeah. an example of why you might remain anonymous. Oh, anyway. absolutely. Um, but, uh, she said that they had falsified data, um, that the, they had unblinded patients and staff. Yeah. Um, cause it's supposed to be a double blind study where, um, ne neither the patients nor the staff know who is in the control group, um, or the placebo group yeah. and who's getting the actual vaccine. Yeah. Um, but, uh, that information was compromised. Uh, yeah. they had made information available in charts and so forth that, that either of these groups could have seen. Yeah. Um, so you don't know how many people were actually unblinded, but, and, but and the, the potential was there. The potential was definitely there. And the suggestion, the way it was reported sounded to me like some people were like intentionally unblinded, yeah. um, that they had, uh, inadequately chained, uh, trained staff, um, that they were slow to follow up on adverse event events that were reported, yeah. um, connected to the vaccines, that the quality control staff were overwhelmed by problems, um, with the uh, with adverse events, um, which is not obviously how it was reported to us. I mean, yeah. like all of this information was omitted from the report to the FDA that Pfizer submitted, as far as I understand it, and that's why they got uh, emergency use authorization. Yeah. Um, now, the uh, there was also something like um, oh, I can't remember exactly the number. There were like 150 roughly. Uh, locations where these trials were taking place. Yeah. Um, the FDA only um, only checked in on four of them. Really? Yeah. Uh, so you that's would, not. You would very think good that coverage. with as big a deal as this is, they mm -hmm. would have been a little more like. Yeah. Uh, looking. There in. would have been some more oversight, yeah. right? Um, and then the FDA reported uh, after this information was released that there were 477 cases of suspected symptomatic COVID-19 that were not swabbed. Yeah. Now, they didn't break it down, so they didn't say, you know, whether those people were from the control group or the vaccinated group or both or, you know, whatever. Yeah. But from the other information that, that 
about this, like the unblinded patients and so forth, and and the push for the high efficacy results that have, I think, in real life, proven to not be not correct. Be. Yeah, um, that it is not unreasonable to suspect that they had, um, that they had um, vaccinated patients that seemed to be presenting with COVID nineteen that they did not swab. Yeah. So that they didn't have to report it as a case of COVID nineteen on a vaccinated patient. Well, and that would kind of bear out with the with the whole thing because if it, if you remember when the vaccine first came out, like that was the big thing was you needed to get vaccinated so you wouldn't spread it. Yeah, uh, like that was the big push. And I know people personally who that was the reason they got it. They were mm-hmm. like, "Well, I don't. I'm, I'm around a lot of people. I don't want to take any chance that I'm going to give this to them." Mm-hmm. Um, and That would kind of jive with... Well, the first thing was that it would protect you from COVID. Well, that was the big thing. Well, that was the other thing, too. Yeah, you don't remember... You remember all those efficacy numbers going up and up and up? Yeah. Oh, well, you know, our data suggests that 92%, it's 92% effective at preventing COVID-19. Yeah. Oh, ours is 94. Oh, ours is 95. Well, it turns out that ours is 96 after more trials. Yeah. You know? Um, there was all that going on. That's clearly not true. Yeah. Like, oh yeah. Like, none of that. That fell apart quick. <laughs> um, and then uh, they said, well, you know, uh, they also said originally, um, I think the Pfizer and Moderna, they said roughly like 91 or 92 percent effective after the first dose, and so yeah. the second dose only gave you a few more percentage points. But you yeah. know, um, this is really common in vaccines. It's not unusual for the first dose to give you a high degree of protection, and the second dose not to give you. But yeah, just, it's hard to re- replicate more. those numbers, yeah, yeah um, to that level. But uh, you know, a lot of this is a lot of this is what really is begging the question. Yeah. Um, what you see in the media, so uh, it turns out that those first two doses aren't really ninety six percent effective. Yeah, uh, it, like that seems really clear. Now, what they're yeah. saying is, oh well, you know, it just wears off quicker than we thought. So right. um, you'll just need a third dose uh, right. to you know to keep your immunity up. And that is like what begging the question really is. It's assuming the thing works in the first place. Right. Yeah, exactly. You just didn't get enough of it. Yeah. Right. Well, and yeah. And and, well, the the obvious thing that I keep pointing out is that, well, yeah, they say that, well, if even if you get COVID with it, that the symptoms are less, Mm -hmm. but you can't really prove that. Yeah. Like there's no way to prove that whether or not you you would be less sick if you had gotten the vaccine versus not. Yeah, that's the other thing. Oh, yeah. That, that one is a, um, a really important point for people to understand, like the flawed logic there. Um, that, well, you know, all these breakthrough cases that are happening, well, they report, well, you know, the, the person didn't get as sick as they would have if they had not gotten the vaccine. You don't know that? There's There's no no way way to know that. (laughs) To know how sick that person would have gotten without the vaccine. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and this is from somebody who got really sick, (laughs) at least when I probably had it. I didn't, um, didn't. Don't you know, or your wife knows somebody that has had the third dose and got COVID and got sick. Oh yeah, 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 absolutely. Mm-hmm. So, so, uh, the, so the third dose isn't uh, ninety six percent effective, probably either. Exactly. Um, and I guess the you know the big question. Well, there's uh, before I move to the big question, I guess. Uh, you know, one of the things that I'd like to point out is this company Ventavia. It was not, it's not a Pfizer company, but they were hired by Pfizer. Yeah. Um, and Pfizer is the, the company that, that presented the results of the testing on their vaccine to the FDA. Yeah. So they're like, responsible for it. Well, but th- there's a problem right there, right? Yeah. Like, wouldn't you want some kind of independent trials oh, of this whole thing? <laughs> well, that's like, why true would too. you let the company who produced the vaccine do their own trials and present their own results without anybody checking up behind them. Especially if you're going to, in the end, mandate this thing. Yeah. And the other part of this is it seems obvious why they can do this. Like, it is not a wonder why they would falsify data or any of this stuff because they're not liable. Yeah. If there is no accountability for it being screwed up, yeah. then there's no reason, there's, there's no incentive not to cut corners. Yeah, yeah. You can just cut corners all you want because you won't be held accountable for it anyway. You're not yeah. liable. Exactly. And so the the single biggest thing that could be done to to protect the health of people in this country, period, um, and you know, ensure that vaccines are safe and effective, is to take away the liability shield. Yeah. Oh yeah. That would change things in a hurry. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, but the, you know, the big question that I feel like not enough people are asking, I think a lot more people are asking it now, but, um, that a lot of people aren't asking is, uh, you know, you have been misled on this over and over and over by the government, by these big pharma companies, by the mainstream media. Like at what point do you stop believing what they're telling you? Yeah. Exactly. I mean, like how many, how many things have to go wrong or be contrary to the apparent facts yeah. um, before you start to wonder if anything that they're telling you is true? Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, it's starting to seem like, um, like Bill Crystal's thing about what, what, at what point would you agree that this was a bad idea to go intervene in this country? And he's like, I don't know, a couple of nuclear bombs going off. <laughs> like, okay, so like, what does it take? At yeah. what point do you start to, to question whether you're, whether the, the pharma companies, the government and the media have your interests at heart? Yeah. Well, I can tell you for sure. A couple of those entities absolutely don't. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm like, certain of that too. I would say yeah. that none of them have your I mean, interests at heart. I would heart, say but, none of them. I would like to at least hope that a couple of them do. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I would like to hope that the pharmaceutical company does, but I know they don't. Yeah. Like, I mean, I know they don't. <laughs> well, they, they have too much lobbying power. Yeah. And then again, it comes back around because I want to make sure that I, I don't start blaming corporations. Now, I think not to say that corporations aren't at fault, but the real problem is the power of the government. If yeah. the corporations couldn't influence the government in such a, it, if the corporations influence on the government didn't have such a significant effect on the market, yeah. that's the way I should say that's, it. That's yeah. Right. If the, if the corporate influences on the government didn't have such an, a significant impact on the market, if, in other words, if the government didn't have such a significant impact on the market, yeah. then you wouldn't have as much of this problem. No, you wouldn't have this problem at all because those companies would be wouldn't would be beholden to the customers. Yeah, and and in this scenario, they're not. Yeah, in any way, like any mm -hmm. way, shape, or form, they're mm -hmm. not beholden. I mean, yeah, like a true free market, the market will regulate. Yeah, exactly. You know, there's a you have a vested interest in not killing or maiming your your own customers. Yeah, um, unless you're going to get paid either way, and you don't. And there's no accountability, which is the yeah. situation. Which now. is the situation we're in. And the only reason that situation exists is because of government interference in the market. Exactly. Yep. Well, that's what I got. <laughs> <laughs> well, felt like a strong ending too. I, yeah. If uh, if we want to call it there. Yeah. Um, let, let me look at my notes real quick and see if there's anything that I uh, that I absolutely that I missed or that I want to point out or no, I don't see anything. I would um, like to say one more thing about the Rittenhouse trial. Yeah. Just that it, it amazes me and it, I guess it shouldn't, but how you feel about the Rittenhouse trial is a very partisan thing. Yeah. Like in, but it shouldn't be like, this mm -hmm. is a self defense case. Like was, did, did this guy like go out there trying to shoot people or was he acting in self defense? Mm -hmm. And, for that to be a partisan thing, it just irks me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but but it's very clearly partisan. Like, depending on where you fall, Republican, Democrat, or in between, is, mm. is influences how you feel about this case. Yeah. And I just think that's sad. Yeah, I, I was talking with a guy at work yesterday, I guess. Um, and we were talking about... Well, I started talking about the uh, Anthony Burgess book... Um, the wanting seed, a wanting seed, the wanting, I think it's the wanting seed. Mm -hmm. Um, now a uh, Burgess is the guy who wrote a clockwork orange. Okay. Um, which, uh, was a really good movie, but it was a better book, um, as they usually are. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, uh, the wanting seed I thought was a much better book. Yeah. Uh, and one of the underlying themes in the book, and it's this kind of, you know, not post apocalyptic, but definitely um, failing, I guess, society yeah. uh, that the, the book is set in, in England um, in this, you know, sometime in the future, yeah. but the not the distant future. I mean, actually it's probably our <laughs> probably past. Probably now, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's probably our past, but it was his future. Yeah. Um, but anyway, one of the underlying themes of the book is, is this natural uh, pendulum swing between conservative and liberal. Yeah. Where... Um, the, you know, the conservative has a, uh, a generally, and this is like a very traditional definitions of these words, not kind of, not really how we use them now, but, yeah. um, 
but the you know the conservative has kind of a pessimistic view of human nature yeah. um, that the uh, that people are generally um, evil and are unconcerned with other people and will do the best for them, which may even be at least it's at least partially true. I don't think yeah. that people are evil, but I do think people are self interested. I just don't equate yeah. those two things. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, the and so in um, a, li- a liberal society where the idea is that people are mostly good and will do the right thing if given the chance, um, that you get increasing anarchy right. um, to a point where there's a backlash against the liberalism and the conservatives move in and it's law and order, lock everything down, far more authoritarian, you know, yeah. make sure that people follow the rules, uh, enforce order. Yeah. Um, but, it, you know, over time, uh, people rebel against the authoritarianism as well. Yeah. Um, and you move into a more liberal direction where people are, are free to make their own choices and um, you get, in, you know, eventually increased anarchy. There's a backlash. So, it, you know, so there's a swing back, back and, and forth. forth. Yeah. In the same way that we see, you know, Republican for two terms, uh, uh, a Democrat for two terms, Republican for two terms, Democrat for two terms, Republican for one term, Democrat for one term, I'm thinking. But... Yeah. Um, Anyway, you have this kind of natural tendency of society to swing back and forth between these mindsets. Um, And I was saying, you know, but the problem now is that we're we're, like the pendulum has stopped. We're not swinging back and forth right now. Like the extremes are moving apart from each other. There's becoming fewer and fewer people in the middle. And the extremes are gaining ground. It looks more like a waveform instead of a a pendulum now. Yeah. Um, And that this is this is really frightening. Yeah. Um, not that I think that the middle has the answer to the problems either, but no. Um, but yeah, the the competing extremes is uh, is seems to me far more dangerous for our future. Well, it's it's crazy and everything. And hopefully, we're presenting a third way. I hope so, um, because I, it's it, politics is in everything now. Like mm-hmm. I, you know, I follow football. I'm in big in the fantasy football mm-hmm. and I go in the fantasy football threads on, on social media in different places. Mm-hmm. It never fails. Like somewhere in that thread, politics is going to come up. Yeah. Um, and there's no reason for it to like, it's, it has no business there. Well, I understand your point, but I would say that, that, um, the government has become so entrenched and has its little tendrils into so many aspects of your life yeah. that it, it is relevant. It, it, a lot of times it is. And like, same thing with cars. <clears throat> I'm big into cars. So I'm in a lot of car groups mm-hmm. and, um, and the same thing happens in the car groups. Um, and sometimes it's silly stuff. And then sometimes, sometimes it's silly stuff and that's just what it is. And that's irritating, but sometimes it's serious stuff, particularly mm-hmm. in the car groups, yeah. because, They'll be talking about regulations and stuff that's going to affect car enthusiasts, mm-hmm. you know. And and in those circumstances, I think politics belongs in those yeah. groups because, like, I mean, we as car people should stand up against that, you mm-hmm. know. Well, I can tell you, any group that I am active in will eventually have some politics discussion because my life <laughs> kind of revolves around all <laughs> well, this stuff. When it's when it's <laughs> relevant, it doesn't bother me. Like mm-hmm. in the car groups, with the w- at least with the stuff that's going to impact our our passion. But um, I can make anything about why the government sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> but but sometimes it's silly stuff, and <clears throat> within the, like in the car groups, a lot of times it'll be something that's in the background of a picture. Yeah. You know, and it'll it'll stir up people. And it's like, mm-hmm. that's not why he posted that picture. You didn't see the beautiful car sitting there? Like, yeah. that was the reason he posted that. He, nobody cares about the flag he has in his garage, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So Apparently somebody does. Oh, they always do. Yeah. It never fails. Anyway. Well, I mean, it's unfortunate, but I, I... If people were better informed, I would be happier that people were more involved in politics. Well, and that's... that's a big problem. Is, um, and yeah, well, the big problem is that are, the mainstream are, media isn't doing you any favors. No, they're not helping that situation at all. And people are so ingrained in their camps that they don't care what they don't care about the details, mm. you know? And that's really kind of what it boils down to is they kind of have an overview and they and they get it from the mainstream media, the overview. And then that's what they run with. Yeah. <laughs> and so they're leading with bad information to begin with. Well, one of the things that I hope that we do with this podcast is, is I, I don't expect us to convert many people, yeah. um, but I hope that we bring enough questions 
to people that they become interested in, go read Lysander Spooner yeah. or uh, Murray Rothbard. Rothbard, yeah. Um, or, you know, one of these great libertarian thinkers and writers. And um, and that that is what really changes them in the end. Yeah. And I think that if you... If you're fair about it and you um, aren't too committed to what you already believe, if you have an open mind, that the arguments are just can't help but sway you. Yeah. Because yeah. I've known so many people that have come from both sides, yeah. uh, both from the right and from the left, conservative and liberal, um, you know, even progressives and neocons, and yeah. like that have started reading, you know, this stuff, um, and within uh, within a year or two are yeah. like devoted libertarians. So so I've always been a libertarian, but mm -hmm. I mean I was further on the neocon side for a long time. Mm -hmm. I mean there was a long period of time I thought the wars were necessary. Mm -hmm. And and I learned different. Like I mm -hmm. I you know the more I found the more I learned mm -hmm. the more I realized I was wrong. And knowing is half the battle. <laughs> and knowing is half the battle. <laughs> the well, other half is extremely violent. And and I came up not really finding a place. Like I, I grew up in a conservative household. Yeah. Um, both of my parents are Republicans. Uh, my mom was more Republican, like traditional Republican. Um, my dad had some real libertarian leanings. Yeah. Um, I don't know that he always did cause we didn't always talk politics, but yeah. I, I certainly in his, in his later years, he did. He was like, yeah. uh, the, the ideas that I expressed to him were appealing to him in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, but I didn't, I didn't know where I stood. Yeah. Um, I, I knew, I didn't think that I was a Republican. Yeah. I knew that I wasn't a Democrat yeah. and eventually for some time, you know, after reading, you know, college and high school and so forth, I was a Marxist. Yeah. Um, like the ideas of, uh, the communist manifesto were appealing. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, was one of those people that talked about, well, the failure of the Soviet union is because it wasn't a natural, uh, a natural Marxist revolution. It was a, it was a forced revolution. Yeah. Um, and that if, and that the closest country to Marxism probably was the United States because it had such a highly evolved capitalism where the rich were getting richer and the poor were getting poorer and the middle class was disappearing and so on. I was like, this is the country that's closest to a real Marxist revolution. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and I saw problems with it, and I, I recognized from the very beginning that you needed a real shift in ideology. Like, yeah. like the way people thought about how they interacted with their world would have to change. And yeah. I thought that that actually would be a natural result of the revolution. Oh, yeah. You know, that that, that revolution would change that mindset. Wow. But I, I realized, you know, somewhere along the way that that just wasn't right. Yeah. Um, and, and I always thought of it as something that just worked really well on a small scale and couldn't work on a large scale. Yeah. Well, we, you need the same thing for what we believe in though. I mean, for a, a true anarchy society, like what you would want, like mm -hmm. beyond the constitution, because I think the constitution is kind of a good stopping point. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I'm good with going further, but yeah. I mean, you got to get there. You got to take it step by step. I think it's step. at least an X on the map. Yeah. Yeah, it's a goal. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, but to get where you would want to be to mm -hmm. full anarchy, you would need a societal change. Like we could. Well, it definitely be a societal change, but I don't know that it would be such a huge ideological change. Yeah. I think that that most people in their hearts are libertarian. Yeah. That mostly they want to be free to live their lives as they see fit. Yeah. They want to be free from interfering from other people taking things from them. Yeah, um, and that includes the government. I used to believe that for a long time. I, I've I've gotten away from that some because I just think that a lot of people want big daddy government there to protect them. Yeah, um, um, I have come to believe that that a lot of people want a king. Yeah. I mean, because I used to believe just like you, I was like, man, we just got to get these ideas out to people because mm -hmm. once they hear them, they're going to be blown like every like everybody else, you know, yeah. or every other libertarian, you yeah. know, and, and that, that people believe in their heart, like in their hearts, like people w really wanted freedom and stuff. Mm -hmm. But the more I see, the more I'm like, yeah, that's true for a lot of people, but there's a lot of people on the other side of that. Well, he here's the problem, though, is... I, I see what you're talking about. And the, the problem that I think that you run into is that um, what people want is security. 
yeah. they believe the government is the answer. Yeah. But if they take the time and really examine their lives and how it's impacted by government in every way, yeah. I think that they, they would realize that government makes them far less secure. Yeah. That and that goes to the education portion. Like mm-hmm. once you once you really start same way with me with the war stuff. Mm-hmm. Like I was um like Are you afraid of terrorists well, yeah. without the government? You don't have to worry about them. Well, exactly. the government is what created the, those the, terrorists. And that's what that's what flipped mm-hmm. me. Yeah. That was, you know, realizing that no, we created this problem. Like yeah. the only reason this problem exists is because of what I'm supporting. So yeah. I'm pulling my support. Yeah. <laughs> So. Not pooling, pulling. Pulling, pulling my support, yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. <laughs> so. yeah. Well, um, you know, it's, I guess the idea here, we're, we're trying to do um, uh, like a better job than these vaccines. You know, <laughs> they're trying to inoculate the public against the government. <laughs> hey, there you go, absolutely. <laughs> and, I like that. You know, just, uh, just you know, keep taking your doses. <laughs> Eventually you'll get there. <laughs> Every week we're going to dish them out for you. <laughs> yeah. Hey, and we did make it two weeks in a row. Look at that. Absolutely. <laughs> Back on track. Yep. Um, although I will be leaving town next Friday, so we definitely have to record next Thursday or earlier. Or Wednesday. Yeah. We'll, we'll plan for Wednesday and then use Thursday as a fallback. Okay. I think that's the right thing to do. Sounds good. I'll be going up to New Jersey where I'll be forced to wear a mask all the time. <laughs> Better breathe. Or suffer the consequences. Or, yep, yep. Or, I don't know what the consequences are, but <laughs> you, I, will, you I will, might find out. <laughs> you will probably end up suffering them. <laughs> I, I might find out. Um, yeah. All right. Well, uh, we'll be back next week um, unless everything falls through before I leave town. Yeah. Um, I will be back on, well, Saturday night. So I'll be back Sunday. Mm-hmm. If uh, if it comes to it, we can, we can record we'll really late. Sunday. But... Um, let's not plan for that. No. Let's, let's, yeah, Worst case so. scenario. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but we'll be back soon. Yep. Uh, regardless. And uh, in the meantime, uh, follow us on Facebook. Uh, subscribe on iTunes, Podbean, YouTube. Um, you can always check the website. I haven't actually started like blogging, blogging on the website, but. Soon, right? You know, maybe. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. I did think of some things that I was like, I should, I should just write up a little bit about that. I was yeah. thinking, okay, so people can say if they would be interested in this kind of thing. Um, if, if I did some like kind of more personal stuff yeah, uh, as a blog, instead yeah. of just talking about politics, yeah. um, just talking about like maybe my outlook a little bit on, on life. I think that would um, be good. Yeah. Because I, I think it's, you know the principles the principles that I apply to politics I try to apply to my life yeah um, and hopefully it would be insightful maybe a little bit to to see some of that that could be fun can, yeah if I can do that and I'll try and keep them short yeah uh, which is hard for me <laughs> um, I'm I like detail context yeah. matters <laughs> absolutely um, so and you just never know where to start a story yeah. because. There's before. Let me start at the beginning. Wait, no, before what's, the beginning. Yeah, what's what's the where does the story really start? Um, well, and, I was six years answer, old. Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> the answer is that there's no real start to any story. Yeah. You just gotta pick a place arbitrarily, and that's yeah. where you're and gonna start you, telling we're, it. We're gonna drop you in. Here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but yeah, follow, uh, subscribe, um, like, and share. Uh, it really helps if you share our stuff out there. Absolutely. Um, really appreciate that. Uh, just to get a little bit more circulation. You know, these uh, ideas are important and, and a lot of people don't get to hear them. Absolutely. So help your friends to hear them. Absolutely. Um, and uh, so join us again uh, next week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. Later.